So in this part of the video, I'll be behind the camera so that I can show you the sediment and the rocks close up. So first we're gonna look at part of the texture of the rock. Um, so remember, rock texture refers to size, shape, and arrangement of grains. So in this part, we're gonna look at size. So grain size is important, especially for siliciclastic sedimentary rocks. Remember that sedimentary rocks composed of pieces of silicate minerals. They are um, named particularly, their, their base name comes from grain size. So we do, whenever we're working with sedimentary rocks, we use a lot of comparators just like we did with igneous rocks. And this one actually shows grain size over here. And it ranges from uh, very fine sand at the bottom to very coarse sand at the top. And it grades in between from very fine to fine, medium, coarse, and very coarse. So if we look at this very first one, this is a windblown sand from Jesse Jones Park. And if we were to look very, very carefully, uh, looking at the grain size comparator to this, I would estimate that it is in the fine grain sand to very fine grain, but mostly in the fine grain sand size. If we look at this one here, which is also from uh, along a stream, this would be more like medium to coarse grain sand. So either lower medium, or sorry, lower, very coarse, or lower coarse grain to upper medium is where that would fit. Here's another sand that grains, grades up into the coarse sand and the very coarse. And then we move over to here where we've actually left sand entirely. We've moved into pebbles. So there's some sand in here, some pebbles. And then this last one, these are just pebbles, no, or nearly hardly any sand size grains at all. So when we look at sisoclastic sedimentary rocks, their base name depends on grain size. Now these are these here are sands, the mixture of sand and gravel, and then um, gravel alone. So if we look at this um, table here, it shows the different uh, grain size names for um, sediment. So if we start you know, you, um, on the on the left side here, it's these are all millimeters. So anything that is between a sixteenth of a millimeter, which is about the thickness of a human hair, to two millimeters, which is about the thickness of a nickel, that is sand size. If it is between a sixteenth of a millimeter and a two fifty-sixth of a millimeter, which unless you're Superman, you probably can't see a two fifty-sixth of a millimeter. So that would be silt size, and then anything smaller than a two fifty-sixth of a millimeter is going to be clay sized. Most of the time when you um, feel some clay, it's going to be very, very um, smooth. It's not going to be gritty. Silt will be somewhat gritty. Sand, of course, is gritty. And then when we get above the um, sand size, we get into pebble, which is anything between 2 and 64 millimeters. And 64 millimeters is about the size of a baseball. And then anything between 64 and 256 millimeters is a cobble. And that's between the size of a baseball and a basketball. And then anything larger than 256 or larger than a basketball is a boulder. And there is no upper limit on boulders. So as long as you have a loose grain that is larger than a basketball and it's not attached to the ground anymore, then it is considered a boulder. <clears throat> now, if we look at um, sand, then, and we look at the rock that makes up, A rock composed of sand is a sandstone. Very simple. So if we have a rock that is composed of sand-sized particles, then it is a sandstone. If we have a rock composed of silt-sized particles, it's a siltstone. Clay-sized particles, it's a claystone. The only one that breaks that is when we get up into gravel-sized particles, all of these over here are considered gravel. Um, if, it is, if those particles are rounded, which we'll get into in a second, then it's a conglomerate, but if they're angular, then it's a breccia. And this, <clears throat> that is how you pronounce it, B-R-E-C-C-I-A is pronounced breccia. Now we also have, sometimes the, to tell, we don't always have pure clay or pure silt. We have a mixture. And when there's a mixture of silt and clay, it's called mud, which 
probably what you get on your shoes, right? And if we're not pure clay for, for the rock, then we would, wouldn't call it a claystone, we would call it a mudstone. And if it does not break into thin sheets, we just call it a mudstone. But if it does break into thin sheets, we can call it shale. So shale is a mudstone. It's a specific kind of mudstone that breaks into thin sheets. All right, so let's take a look at some of these rocks. All right, so here is a sandstone. It is a rock composed of sand-sized particles. And if I took my hand lens here and I looked very carefully at these grains, I would see that in fact they do fit in this size. So between a 256 of a millimeter down here at very fine sand and two millimeters up here at very coarse sand. And of course, if I feel it, it feels a lot like sandpaper, which is pretty much what you would expect. So this is one type of sand. Notice that when we're looking at it here in the video, it essentially looks like one color. It's almost entirely white. When we see a, um, a sandstone that is almost entirely one color, chances are that that, um, that one color indicates one mineral. And the most common mineral in siliciclastic sedimentary rocks is quartz. So this we would call a quartz sandstone. So a quartz sandstone is a sedimentary rock that has at least 90% quartz. To get that much quartz in it, it has to be recycled over and over and over until every other mineral has been weathered away. Quartz is essentially completely resistant to chemical weathering. It will undergo physical weathering. It can be broken into smaller pieces, but it does not chemically react with anything in, on, the at the, on the surface of the earth. So it will resist any sort of chemical breakdown into some other, um, either other mineral or <clears throat> into another compound of some sort. So quartz sandstones are commonly found on, they're, they're defined this much quartz sand, it's commonly found on uh, barrier island beaches or Grand Strand beaches, somewhere where the rock, where the minerals has, the, the, the rock that makes, the, that released those minerals, the source rock, has been really, really heavily weathered. It's traveled a long distance. It is what we would call mineralogically mature because it has been severely weathered and pretty much all that's left is the quartz. Everything else has been weathered away. So that's a quartz sandstone. If we look at this sandstone, again, if we took our hand lens and our sedimentary comparator here, we would see that it is indeed sand size. It's a bit gritty and when we look at it and that grittiness tells me that it's made of sand but it's not it's not white this time. It's not white or light tan. Um, it is really red. So this red coloring is the result of hematite and hematite is is uh, actually the same thing as if you leave your tools outside <clears throat> and they get rusty, that rust, Fe203, is the same as this hematite. Hematite is natural rust. So this is essentially a rock in which the, um, the minerals that were weathered to make this, the sediment that makes up this rock, they were um, uh, included some iron and that iron rusted, forming iron oxide, which is hematite. But notice, although there's a red coloring, there really isn't any other color mixed in here and that really tells us again it's probably all one mineral other than the hematite um, the mineral grains themselves are not hematite they are another mineral with a hematite stain so the outside of the rock or the outside of the minerals have been stained with hematite think of uh, hematite as kind of like um, a kind of paint or pigment uh, it doesn't enter into the mineral but it sticks on the outside in fact hematite is actually used in very old style paints that um, maybe during the Renaissance or something like that, they would have mixed it with some oils and it would have actually formed a paint pigment. But this is called a hematitic sandstone and the, the, the mineral that makes up most of the rock, the most of the grains, the framework grains, the actual grains that are the rock, uh, that's quartz. Um, the common place where we see this sort of sand, uh, this, is, this is a sand here that was collected in the Sahara Desert. So 
these sorts of red sands are very common on land. So we would tend to see them in the desert or along rivers, um, maybe not right away, but over time <clears throat> they will, the, the minerals in them will, will the, the iron bearing minerals will rust. Uh, that happens more so on land than in water. So that's a hematitic quartz sandstone or hematitic sandstone. Here's another really common um, sandstone that we talk about and that you, that you have in your textbook. This is an arcos. Now, if we look carefully, of course, some of these grains are obviously larger than two millimeters. They're really pebbles. But if we look at the other side, that's all sand. So we have a layer of pebbles with, with sand mixed in. This is very common in this type of rock. This is called an arcos. Arcos requires that it has at least 25% feldspar. So the reason why this one's convenient is that these grains here are large enough that we can see them and they are, um, those are feldspar grains. These white ones are quartz. The very small grains in between are either smaller pieces of quartz and feldspar or clay. Because feldspars will, in the presence of water, feldspars will pretty quickly weather to clay minerals um, and uh, release some of the ions in solution. So to have feldspar grains in here means that there's not a lot of water. So typically um, the, the sediment that makes up an arcos is uh, weathering a granite, first of all, in, in the presence of very little water. So we're looking at arid to semi-arid conditions. Now an arcosic sediment would look like this. This is actually from Enchanted Rock area. And Enchanted Rock, of course, is um, made of granite. <clears throat> In fact, this is the granite from Enchanted Rock. This is the sediment that weathers out of that granite. There's some feldspars, just like these big pink ones. Those big pink ones are feldspar. Remember, the, the, these white grains are um, quartz, and the dark ones are uh, hornblende and or biotite. Now, there's not a whole lot of biotite shown in here. We can see some quartz grains. So these little kind of tan-colored ones are quartz. This one's feldspar, potassium feldspar in particular, case bar. But there's really not much else. There looks like there might be some biotite or must that look maybe that's a grungy little biotite there. Sometimes there's some like glittery grains. Those are the muscovite if it's released. But in order to get to for this to become an arcos, this has to this sediment has to not be weathered any further than this. It might be broken down into smaller pieces, so it might be physically weathered a bit more, but it cannot be severely chemically weathered, or all of these feldspars would become clay minerals, and we would not get an arcos because those clay minerals would all be gone. Now, let's pause for a moment talking about sandstones and think about uh, some different features of these sands, and in particular, this one here. Now, sands that are windblown, and this is going to be really hard for you to see in um, without looking at it with the hand lens, but if I look at this under the hand lens, see if I can, I'm not sure I can bring that in focus really, maybe a little bit but those grains are very well rounded. So rounding is an important feature to note in a sedimentary rock. And to see it a little, since those grains are very small, I'll bring in some much larger ones. So rounding has to do with the amount of corners and edges. So this is a granite from, our, our, from the last, from the igneous rock videos. And notice that there are no corners and edges. They've all been knocked off. This has corners and edges. So even though these are both 
essentially particles of sediment. This one is clearly rounded, very well rounded, and this one is angular. It has a lot of corners and edges. So rounding is um, a measure of the amount of corners and edges. Now in this little comparator and in your lab handout, this, the properties of sedimentary rocks, there is a um, visual comparator showing roundness. So this here is well rounded. Rounded has, and, and there's, it's often that you can say either rounded, sub-rounded, sub-angular, angular. Some people will go well rounded, even very well rounded, meaning no corners and edges. Most of the time it's well rounded, rounded, sub-rounded, sub-angular, and then angular. So when we get to angular, notice that there's a lot of corners and edges. So this, if we were thinking about, um, if it, this was a sand grain and it was just enlarged really big, then we would say that this is angular. But even as a, a pebble, now this is, this one's here, this one's a cobble because it's bigger than a baseball. This one is smaller than a baseball, so it's actually still a pebble. So this pebble is angular, whereas this cobble is rounded. And rounded does not mean spherical. These two are pebbles that are still rounded. Even though this has somewhat of an edge, there's no sharp, there's no sharp edge on it. It's a rounded edge. It's been completely rounded. It just happens to not be spherical. So roundness is one parameter that we look at. Sphericity is another. Now we're not going to do that in this class, but if we were concerned with um, something about sediment that uh, that it would be helpful to know sphericity, then we would um, also include that. But in this case, we're just looking at corners and edges. So even though these are rod and, I don't know, flattened rod shape, they're still rounded. And if we go smaller, these are also well rounded. No corners, no edges. So if we take a look at this stream gravel, there are some that are that are angular, some pebbles. There are some that are quite well rounded. And that's very common to have a mixture of roundness and uh, of, of the, uh, the varying degrees of roundness. And streams typically have subangular to uh, grain size, or sorry, uh, subangular roundness. Some cases, sub uh, we get uh, subrounded to subangular is very common in stream gravel. This one here. This is our, um, the gravel from Enchanted Rock area. The sands themselves are quite angular. This one is even more boxy shaped. I don't know if you can see that in there, but it's got um, pretty much this, the shape of a rectangular prism. And that is uh, not rounded at all. So we're looking here at very angular, pieces, you know, angular to subangular in some cases, but mostly very angular. These boxy pieces are, um, are not even subangular, they are angular. And what that tells us is this has not been moved much by water or wind. This is a beach cobble. This was brought to the beach by a stream and then as the waves hit it, it runs sand over top of it. It might tumble this. Uh, first in the stream it was you know, comes rolling down through the through the mountain stream, deposited on the beach, uh, might be tumbled some more, and even if it's not tumbled, the sand might be running across it. And that tends to knock off the corners and edges fairly quickly. If it is not moved by water or wind, then that tends to be very angular. And that's how we can tell textural maturity. If it is very angular, um, and also notice that this is not well sorted. This is not um, one type of grain size like this one is. It's almost all exactly the same grain size. Wind is a very good sorter. Water is the next best sorter. Gravity and ice are terrible sorters. So those are the different modes of transportation of sediment. We have wind, water, gravity, and ice. Wind and water will sort sediment with wind the best and water second best. <clears throat> Gravity, which is mostly what's moving this one, 
um, along with some water in the in streams, then it is not very well uh, rounded. So we can tell distance for transport from the source area. So this sediment here did not move very far. It's just at the base um, of Enchanted Rock out in uh, Fredericksburg. So it just really only moved maybe a few hundred feet from its source area, where this one here may have moved hundreds of miles and maybe millions of years from its source area. So when we are looking at these sediments, we can tell something about how far it moved as well as climate. So when we have an arcos or an arcosic sand, then we know that it's going to be arid to semi-arid and not far from the source area. When we see almost all quartz, then we know that it moved very far from its source area. And when we see rounded um, grains, then we know it has traveled some distance, maybe very far, especially when it gets smaller. Large pebbles don't tend to move terribly, terribly far because you think about over time, they get, um, they get fractured, they get ground down. Um, so they're not gonna stay very large for very long. So that gives us most of our texture. We get grain size from silt and mud to sand. We've got grain shape for roundness, and then we have sorting for whether they're all one grain size, maybe a mixture of different grain sizes to you know, a mixture of a small difference in grain sizes to a great mixture. Here we've got sand mixed with gravel. So that covers our um, sandstones primarily, and um, the next I will go through from the next video will cover the entire range of siliciclastic sedimentary rocks.